Oh, please have some underwear. Okay. Whew. I agree, you know, if this is gonna be your final days, might as well have a nice hot bath. Hey guys, it's your girl Laisha, aka Geek XX Chic, and we are back with another episode of Shogun. We're now on to episode seven, which is called A Stick of Time. So the last episode was centered around the wonderful ladies of this world. We got to learn more about Lady Ochiba, who was introduced to us at the end of episode five. We didn't see a lot then, but last episode gave us some more insight into her past and the connection that she has to Toronaga and to Mariko and to the former Taiko and kind of how all of that interconnects with this real venom that she seems to have for Toronaga. She's under the belief that Toronaga is indirectly responsible for her father's death, which of course had a huge impact on her life and her future. And I'm going to surmise that she also feels some type of way about Mariko as well. They were friends as children, but of course, life and circumstances drove them apart. And now because she is working so closely with Toranaga, I'm assuming that Ochiba considers her to be a bit of an enemy as well. And so we see that Toranaga recognizes that Ochiba being back in Osaka has accelerated a lot of things as far as the council. It's created some tensions and he's not really sure why. He's still trying to understand the reason why she has such a direct line of issue with him. And I like that Mariko gave him a little bit of insight as far as the fact that women and men have different reasons for the, why, the reasons why they operate and do the things that they do. But anyhow, there was a little bit between Mariko and John. We see that John was given yet another promotion thanks to what he did to help Toranaga again from the um, after the landslide and that Toranaga rewarded him with giving him a night with one of the best courti uh, courtesans in the area. And this was also to soften the blow about the fact that John wanted to leave and he's not giving, he's not granting that leave to John just yet. And so John had this night with the courtesan and Mariko was there to translate. And we see that there was a very interesting moment between the two of them, just basically cementing the fact that they do in fact still care about each other a lot, but it's complicated of course, because her husband Bontaro is still very much a factor, even though we hear that uh, Toranaga encouraged him to seek a divorce if he can't figure out a way to be peaceful with Mariko in the future. So a lot of stuff is going on, but basically Osaka is now in a place where they've gotten rid of one of the regents who refused to vote to impeach Toranaga. They're putting somebody else in his place and Toranaga is recognizing that they have to make a very swift and bold move to get this war in their favor now. And they, we found out that they had a plan called Crimson Sky, I believe it was. And this was like a Hail Mary, we're gonna rush the city, hope that we can take it over and basically create a new shogunate with me at the top. And if that doesn't work, we're basically gonna die trying. So that was where we ended the episode with them deciding to go with this plan. And we know that Yabashige is in the middle of all that and he's not happy about it at all. So not sure we're gonna go into this particular episode because the Tornaga that I know does not wanna go with a plan that is so, where, they, where the odds are not in his favor. So we'll see if he's got any backup plans by watching this episode right now. But just before I do, a reminder that if you'd like to be notified of when I do uploads of this show or anything else you might be watching of mine, please hit that subscribe button and that notification bell and show some love to this video if you are feeling it. All right, they're out of the way. Let's get into the episode right now. Oh no, oh no. Are we flashing back or forward here? What war? Is this a vision he's having? Don't play with my emotions. I mean, if this is him in 46 years ago, okay. Cause I was like, wait, this boy, where's the beard? <laughs> wow, okay. Who is the war against? Maybe. Was it fate? Or has Tornaga always just been that damn smart? Okay. But I mean, we learned this back in episode two, right? That Tornaga was kind of forced into being this smart because of his childhood, right? See, this, you'd be taking too long with all this. If I was gonna do this, I'd have to do it quick. Like ripping off a bandaid, just whoosh, whoosh, ah, just whoosh, whoosh, ah, I can't. Maybe. Oh God, oh God, the side, sideways, why, ooh. 
Tornog was always a savage, yo. Now you understand why he is the way he is, man. His son really has no idea. It's interesting because I kind of like how they're showing that sometimes people are just damn good at something from like a very young age. It just kind of sucks that Tornaga's skill has been battle. Mm, this man is so fine. What, what, what are we waiting for, guys? Why, is, why does the forest look so ominous? <laughs> Brother? Thank you for softening the blow. Mm, she said, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I know my job. Do yours. Now that is a hat. How does he even keep his head up? Mm. I was afraid of that, yeah. I mean, I didn't put it that way. Those are your words. Oh, oh, calm down, Gramps. Brothers, huh? Alright, like, he is handsome. The man's fine, aging like a fine wine. Tamed? Wow. Wow. Rude. Right? This is the kind of situation that could literally get us all beheaded, so please behave. Okay, he said, I memorized. Okay, a little transparency. Thank you. This seems like it's going way too easy. Don't smile yet, Junior. Onsen, yes. I don't know. This seems like it went a little too easily. I want to believe. I do. I'm scared. Mongrel? Damn. Does this order of Crimson Sky mean that I'm to be given maritime command during our attack? Valid question. He's like, I know what he's asking. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Mm, leave me alone. Our Lord has made no decision regarding you or your service. And I suggest you take this no further. Right? Not the time, John. Although I understand. If a war is about to brew, I want to get the hell out too. I'm beginning to wonder if these gifts have any bloody meaning at all. I mean, they're really just to keep you distracted. I urge you to let this go. She's like, please! Bro, you're killing me. Please tell him I am ready for whatever our fate may bring. Thank you, John. John has learned the last time he pushed when Mariko begged him not to, she ended up with a busted up face. So, and again, not that that was his fault, but... Just trust her when she says sometimes it's not the time. Whole week? That's what a stick is? Damn! Mm. She's gently saying no. Uh, Okay. If that your house has been spoiled, does that mean Kiku's been spoiled too? That's that your attitude? Okay. Not you spreading rumors, miss. But I'm sure she did that for Kiku. It's just so stupid. I'm sorry. I really hate how men do that. Judge a woman based on who she slept with. Like, how about we just turn that mirror around, sir? Oh, is it her family? Again? Oh. Oh. I forgot that she would have had to leave that behind. Is that the best thing to do, though? Yeah. I know, in the moment, but... I don't think your husband wanted that. Or maybe he did. He was kind of an idiot, but... It's looking a little bit murky right now, but let's hope so. Your son's kind of an idiot. 
It's interesting because Bentaro's dad seems a lot more level-headed than Bentaro, but what do I know? Can you stop talking? You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yes, exactly. Many? Seriously, I just keep wondering how Toronaga's son is so different from him in like every way. But then again, we didn't see what young Toronaga was like, so let me be quiet. Okay, I don't know why you were looking there, but if you say something, something tells me he's still very proudly a virgin. Oh, damn. Really? I think you had your time, Toronaga, because you fine. Some remarks about how long it has been since he has seen Nagakato-sama. Don't be jealous, Buntaro. Don't be jealous. Stop. Exactly. Stop stirring shit, Omi. Stop. Okay? I know you're jealous that your woman was with her, but it's her job. Grow up. Yeah, that's what, what is, what was he like? I mean, when you're him, you're him. You know? Tornaga's not proud, you notice that? It's not wrong about that. Wow, okay. D damn. Yeah, we gotta do this in front of everybody, huh? Okay, here we go. Here comes where the real family beef's gonna come out. Our mother. What? And? Is that funny? That a child was sold into bondage and was scared? That's funny? Sure, sure. That's why you brought it up. I'm sure. Wait a minute. Shido? Damn, it was a trap. Or one of the Christian lords. Hmm. Y'all are too late. I know Toronaga expected this. I know he did. He must have. Oh, kill him. Now I see why he called you a mongrel. I'm sorry for chastising you for that one, Kuranaga. <laughs> no, never going back. That was actually a, that was a smart stroke. I have a feeling Ochiba, Ochiba put him up to it. Mm. He doesn't care about that. He's getting back at his big brother. I mean, you did do that. Mm -hmm. Tornaga never acts rashly. Mm. Yep, well, Tornaga's like, I always wanted to be an only child, and I guess that's gonna have to come true. Thank you for making it easy for me, bro. Mm. Although I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm actually mad interested in why those two are beefing. My guess is jealousy, though. What happens if he surrenders? We all die. As I check the keel, she'll need careening and scraping. Yabushige's men could help with stepping the spare bowsprit in in the hold. And we'll do what? And do what? And then we could be out of that channel and. And go where? Finish it, John. What could we do, Anjin Sama? Yeah, like seriously, this is his home. Tornaga has nowhere to go. Standing here, pissing around. I do agree with that, but your plan, half baked. This is this people's homes. This is this is thousands, possibly millions of people, John. I know for you, I understand it. You didn't ask to be part of it, but you did sail here. <laughs> you could have minded your business back in England, to be fair. Oh, my baby Tornog, I don't know why everybody keep trying you like this. Oh, throw back to the battle. Yeah, 
Yep. I mean, you had to know that was going to happen. You did let his general get killed by the boy. So I think this is like for like, no? Yamashige is insane, y'all. Reggie, whose crest is that? Ishiro-sama. Very wonderful. Keeps getting better and better. Yeah, let the man think, please. I'm nervous. Don't you cheat me right now. Exactly. Period. Right? Just zip it. This boy has learned nothing. Your impulsivity is half the reason we're here. This boy? Exactly. That boy needs to stop letting, let, let the grown folks talk, okay? Get back to the kids' table and simmer down. Exactly, to the point. He's like, I got a lot on my mind, hurry up. I don't blame her. She's got to try. This is all the power she's got. A red light district? I love a woman with a business mind. He didn't say no. Oh. Right? Someone needs to pep talk this man. Don't give up. Okay. Period. Mm -hmm. Exactly. She said, I'm going to turn it to what I need it to be. Mm, who to thunk? That's right. Mm -hmm. She sees you. Hmm. Hmm, why would he? He's like, damn, you're a smart woman. Hmm. Yeah, she does, actually. She sees you a little too well, huh, Toronaga? If it was a different world, she should probably be your wifey. Damn. You're a smart woman is what you are, ma'am. You did what needed to be done, sis. Thank you. She's like, I know you are too smart for all this, sir. You're not a man who only has one step. You've got several planned. Everyone's so trigger happy. God. Oh, please have some underwear. Okay. Whew. I agree, you know, if this is going to be your final days, might as well have a nice hot bath. Because it's Toronaga. The way you don't know anything about your dad, this kid bothers me. Exactly. Talking so damn loud and stupid. Exactly. Yeah, if this was Troubles, you would not be sending him to his death. This kid! No, oh, prick that ego. That always works. Seriously, Tornaga's son needs a spanking. I don't know what to tell you. Spanking and a timeout for at least two weeks. Damn. I, I don't, I don't, that was not a swift end, sir, at all. That's right, because you, you deserve it. If your ass had picked a side, maybe you wouldn't be here. Yeah, seriously, you should learn how to do at least a few moves. This seems to be occurring. <laughs> I'm using that one. Well, this seems to be occurring. He's like, I don't care. Let's get to this lesson. Times of the essence. 
Oh, come on, Buntaro. Don't be jealous. Just be friends. We can all be friends. <laughs> oh, God. You're laughing. I thought I was supposed to laugh. I don't know. She still won't like you even if you kill him, Bentaro. Oh, exactly. He spared your life. Hmm. Coward. Any man who puts his hands on a woman. Coward. Oh, really? Sure, sure. John may be a lot of things, but a coward is not one of them. Okay, look at this. I love it. My badass girls. That is a solid bar. We do what we can when we can. Yep. And honestly, anyone dying because of that display back in episode one, like that was just not, not necessary. Everyone could have kept their cool. Everyone would still be alive. You're assuming they let your family survive? I knew he'd give it to her. I knew he would. Because he didn't really say no. He just said, I don't think I'm going to live long enough to make sure this happens. Or he wanted a divorce. Oh. Why? Exactly. Why? Yeah, that's kind of with both of us. That's mutual. Right? Say what you want to say with your chest. Right? Oh, yeah, make her suffer more. Sure. Yeah, answer the damn question. Exactly. Is that what we want to do? Right? She's I'm not giving him anything. I'm not going to beg for my life, sir. I never have. Oh, really? Exactly. It's got to be a two-way street. Mm-hmm. Mm. Take a nap, have a Snickers, and get it together. He's like, so what's the real taste is? Because I feel like... <laughs> exactly. I feel like there's some truth in that. Mm-hmm. いい。こちらが選ぶのじゃ。苦しみの川で溺れ続けることに見えておりますね。It's like, let me have this one thing. John is the one thing I don't hate in my life right now. You're asking too much, sir. Come on, Toranaga. You gotta come up with something, bro. Oh, is that him behind him? In the flashback? Yeah, that would be hard for a 12-year-old. Very hard. Damn. God. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's not funny. How come John doesn't get pretty armor? So what are we doing? Oh my sweet baby Jesus. Oh God. No, does anyone have superpowers? No one? Formal answer is to kiss the roundest part of my ass. Shut up. John's like, I wasn't prepared to die. <laughs> That's not what I signed up for. I mean, get it out, John. He's not lying. <laughs> He's like, yeah, in the Western world, we storm out when we're mad. That's really what you want, isn't it? Jealous little shit. 
all of that, you're still going to be a nobody because Ishido's going to kill every last one of you. Every last one of you. Oh, you've got a little chokehold on him, huh? You know what to do, sis. You know what to do. Tighter. What you got in mind, Kiku? Yes, torturous tools. You can count on nothing else. Amanda be a freak -a leak Do what you gotta do, Kiku. I think this is a bad idea. I don't know. I mean, these men have every right to fight for their lives. Why are you running around in your dress, sir? Come on, you're a badass warlord. You're a regent now. Stand up. Stand up. Oh my God. Damn, bro. Damn. Toronaga's legacy gone. You know, one false step. Wow. Something told me I had a feeling he was gonna die. I just did not think it was gonna be like that. Of, oh my God, of all things, people to be taken out by a wet rock? A wet rock? And you know, it probably wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have hesitated, but you know what? I, I'm not even gonna say that he shoulda, coulda. I mean, that's still his uncle and that was a desperation move. Oh my gosh, what a mess. What a mess, what a mess. Oh my God. Okay, oh uh, wow. All right, let's 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 talk about some of the highlights of this episode. It was tense. And you know, you know a show is good when you don't have like, there was no action this episode. Not really, not until the end here. And even that barely counted. There was nothing in this episode yet. I was tense the entire time. I had anxiety, like just sitting like a ball in my chest. Cause I was like, what's going to happen? What's going on? Like does Tornaga really not have another plan? And I almost feel like he does have other ideas or steps that he thinks he can take, but he's scared to do it because there's so many, there's so much potential collateral damage that anything that he would try at this point, the amount of death that would occur, the amount of casualties, the amount of just unnecessary bloodshed would just negate the whole point. And that's kind of what has him hamstrung. But I just can't think, I mean, based on what we saw and the way he was talking about him, he knew his brother was not someone to be trusted. He had to know that his brother had something up his sleeve. Like maybe he thought it was gonna be more of a greed thing, where like his brother would want lots of things from him. And I think Tornaga was more than willing to promise him, you know, fiefs and, and other types of things. But I don't think, maybe he didn't anticipate that his brother would actually betray him to the point of death. But I, I just don't see that. Like Tornaga to call him my, my mongrel brother. Like that's low. Like to call, like, you know what you have to dislike your, your own sibling to refer to them as a dog, like a, a dog that should have never happened. Like mongrels are the term you give to something that you think shouldn't have happened, right? It's like, it's considered like a dirty mixture, right? So for him to refer to his own brother that way, they clearly don't have any love there. And I feel like Toronaga is not the kind of person who lightly dismisses family. Again, I know he doesn't necessarily, the, he's not the warmest guy in the world, but I just don't think someone he grew up with that he would have that type of sentiment towards them unless there was some real reason for that to be the case. So I, I don't know, I'm just surprised. I'm like, would Toronaga really not have expected that his brother could potentially betray him? Or maybe, like I said, maybe it's just timing. Maybe he expected it, but he thought it would happen later on, not, not, not at the hands of Ishido and the council. But I guess I also have to keep in mind that there are certain things that are just as much of a planner and a strategist as this Toronaga is, there's things that are just outside of his control, like a natural disaster, which is what happened a couple of episodes ago. He couldn't have known that there'd be a massive earthquake and that a landslide would ensue that took out a good chunk of his military. And remember I said that in that episode, they didn't really talk about it too much, but I was like, it looks to me like a good chunk of that cavalry he brought in got taken out by the landslide and not just the village. So yeah, his numbers got reduced. He did not expect that. A lot of what he probably planned to like set up for his battle strategy, that got interrupted by the literal landscape change changing. So those are things you just can't really anticipate or really fully plan for, right? So I guess maybe he really, that did throw him off too much. Losing half of, well, it sounds like about half of his infantry, it made him desperate in the sense of I need people and who's the closest and only possible ally that would be willing to lend me people and lend me aid at this point. I guess I got to go to family. And I, I am interested, I'm not going to lie. I'm very interested in finding out what happened there. I mean, we don't really have time for it in this series, but 
I would definitely be interested to find out what caused the bad blood between him and his brother. I mean, I'm assuming just looking at the interactions right now of his little brother, he seems like he's a bit jealous and I could kind of get it. Like Toronaga has this reputation that's already out out there in Japan. He's he's known as this master trickster. He's known as a, a strategic genius. He's very wealthy. He's successful. He's attractive. He, you heard, um, oh, apparently he had a lot of women back in the day. Like he's the kind of guy that everyone wants to be. And again, I don't know what his brother was up to, but I'm assuming his brother didn't have those skills, didn't go through those things. Or maybe it was a thing that started when they were very young. Like he mentioned that story about how he was sold off to be a hostage as a child and their mom basically comforted him and told him like, this is your bloodline, this is your legacy and then sends him off. And, you know, he had to make sure to try to embarrass him and say, oh, but he crapped himself. Like, and again, as I said in the episode, does that make you feel like a man by trying to shame a boy for rightfully being scared about being sent off to his father's enemies where he could be abused and murdered? That's, that's funny. That's funny to you that he had a very real response as a child, right? And from what we hear, like Tornaga was young, like he was maybe what, nine, 10 years old? Bro, you would have probably thrown up and passed out. What are you talking about? But anyways, I'm just thinking that maybe the mom had a special place for him because of that. I mean, that would make sense. Most mothers, if they have a child that's gone through something traumatic or that child was taken away from them or separated from them, they're gonna have that kid in a very special place in their heart. You know what? Yeah, actually that might've been it. Again, I'm I'm totally extrapolating here. I've not read the books. I don't even know, I don't know if it's in the books, but I can see it being a situation where when Toronaga was sent off to be the hostage, the mom became like obsessive about if he's okay, what's going on with him. And then maybe unfortunately inadvertently neglecting her younger son because she knew he was there and he was safe. And it just kind of became a thing where unfortunately she kind of pushed her other son away and only had, you know, emotional room for Toronaga and worrying about him until he returned to her. And then when he got back, she probably again, just prioritized him because she hadn't been around him for so long. I don't know, th that kind of thing does happen and it could definitely create resentment in a younger child. But anyway, we don't need to get too much into it because honestly, it just comes down to whatever the reason, his brother wants to get that. I mean, I don't, let's, don't get me wrong. I mean, I understand what his brother said about self-preservation. I mean, if Ishido basically is like, look, if you join forces with your brother, we have more, we're gonna take you out, you're gonna die, and for what, y'all aren't even close anyway. Like, I kind of get where his brother would be coming from from there, like, it is a self-preservation game to some degree, and I mean, if he also is kind of jealous of him and kind of wants what he wants, or wants what he has, I should say, it's kind of win-win for him, but typically, typically family bonds are quite strong, and most people would rather, especially in this society, would rather take their lives than betray their own. So for him to feel like, that was the answer. It's just sad. Clearly there was something very broken between the two of them. And it looks like as well, Toronaga, this was absolutely his last resort because he did not want to go to this man and have to grovel at his feet of all things to ask for help. But anyway, we got to see, uh, we got to hear some more stories. We got that flashback of Toronaga as a kid, the very first battle that he won. And obviously I don't think that battle was won by him Physically, it was about, again, the fact that this kid, this man has always had an amazing strategic mind and that when it comes to warfare and placing chess pieces, he's damn good at it. We heard the, the enemy guy there say like, you baited me, that was fate that I was baited into this war that I couldn't win. And I'm sure that was Toronaga. That sounds exactly like Toronaga, Toronaga's MO. Let me do these things and put things in place that will force him to do what we want him to do and then we'll take our victory. And so from a very young age, Toronaga has had a mind for this. He's someone who's been able to make these strategic decisions and think in this way that a, clearly not a lot of people are able to do. And I, I feel like it started out as a survival skill, but something that he just continued to use. And him having to be the one to behead this man at, this, at the age of 12 is insane. Like what that would have done to him, what that would have done to break and change him in certain ways is kind of crazy to think about. And I really like that while we don't really know Toronaga, like we've seen how smart he is, we've seen how cunning he is, we've seen how cold he can be, but we really don't know him as a man. Like we don't really know what motivates him at this point. We, we don't really know his true heart as it were. And I think that from what we've seen, I don't think Toronaga is a, I don't think he's like a cold blooded sort of person, right? I don't think he's necessarily warm and fuzzy either, but 
The fact that he didn't do more to his son, for example, for being an impetuous idiot and starting this thing earlier than he planned. The fact that he has ordered people to live when letting them die would be fine and really no loss to him whatsoever, like Fuji, like, yeah, like Fuji, like Mariko. Um, the fact that he seems to have real genuine affection for the heir. Like there's just certain things that he does and says that shows you that there is this warmth in him somewhere, that there are these soft spots. But as someone in my comments brought out for the last episode, it's very possible that Tornaga is also the same guy that very well may have set up Mariko's father to do what he did. Like it was clear that both him and Mariko's dad knew that the old leader, the original leader had to go. But Tornaga was probably smart enough to know that he couldn't be the one to do it. Not if he wanted to protect himself, his family, and what he had. But if he could find a willing person, if he could find a way to manipulate someone, remember the examples that he gave to his son a couple episodes ago about the different types of birds and how they hunt. If he could have done that strategy where he talked about finding the right person who you can feed the right information and do what they need, you know, say what you need to say and put things in place so that they'll do your dirty work for you, right? He was of course referring at that point to Yabashige and Omi, but that doesn't mean that he wouldn't have done it himself and that he hasn't done it himself. We've seen him do it. He's done it to the council several times, created situations where they will act in a way that he predicts that they will act. He could have done the same thing to Mariko's father and just thought, you know, as much as I like this man, I need a fall guy and I need someone who could do this for me, who's close enough to the leader to do it. And I, as, as a compensation for that, I'll take care of Mariko and make sure she's good. And what's what I can protect of his family. You know what I mean? Like maybe he thought that was a worthy sacrifice. It's cold if that's the case. It's very cold that he would do that. And that would definitely break the relationship that Mariko and that loyalty Mariko feels for him. But I can't say that Tornaga wouldn't do that. I'd like to think he wouldn't, but I can't say he wouldn't because we don't know, as I said, enough about him to know where his moral boundaries lie. And so... Anyway, I just thought that um, seeing that he had to do such a crazy thing at such a young age of not only starting a war and manning the, the plan behind it, but then executing a man, that's something, like I said, is going to change and break him in ways that I can't even imagine. That would just strip any little bit of innocence or childlikeness he would have ever had away from him so young. And it kind of explains why I understand why he, is, he doesn't tell people that story, right? He's not proud of that moment. Not because even though his his strategy, his expertise are things that should be celebrated, people died. And the fact that you can see that he's never forgotten that this man looked him in the eye and the things that he said, like that really affected him. That really changed things in him. And so I think that it's something that that just forms and informs a lot of the way that Toranaga is and the decisions that he's made. And I just think that... Uh, it kind of comes back again to the 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 um the conversation that him and the madam why can't I think of her name Jin, uh, the the lady who runs the the tea house. That conversation was amazing, right? Where she comes to him and especially now of all times, but I guess she kind of had to, right? Who else could she go to? I was thinking, why wouldn't she go to like Ishido or one of those people? But she can't. Anyway, um, when she's going to him and looking at how she can preserve herself and set up a future for not only herself but all the other women who are currently courtesans who are aging and who will eventually age out of being considered the desirable courtesans to be hired. Like how can we protect ourselves from becoming basically homeless and beggars, right? Because back in those times, I can't, I mean, this is me assuming, cause I don't know all the things about ancient, ancient Japan, but if it's like a lot of other parts of the world, women weren't really able to make money or have agency around their money and income and living situation without a man, AKA a husband or some male benefactor who was willing to take care of them. I mean, yes, they were able to do the courtesan type work or geisha type work, but that was only while they could do that work, right? That was while they were still employable, able to do things to sustain themselves. But once that ended or they weren't able to do that, they would really be at the mercy of the world because they have no other way. Like women didn't work back then. There was no jobs. Like she could go out and just get another job. So what could you do to take care of yourself? Because that's the other thing. These courtesans, once they're done working, I highly doubt, sadly, because of the perception men have around women who've had multiple partners. Well, I was going to say then, but even now. But anyway, most men probably would not marry a retired courtesan, right? Because of their own worries or their own reputation they'd have to worry about. So they're really left and stuck when that's all said and done. And so I really admire that she was like, I've thought of a way to preserve myself and how to create a system where these aging out court, um, courtesans will still have value and still be able to support themselves and sustain themselves while also teaching the future 
of the courtesans and keep this whole cycle going. And so she presents this to Coronaga. And I think honestly, Coronaga is very impressed with the fact that she has this amount of business acumen and that she's coming to him and yeah, that this whole thing is set up, that she's clearly thought it through. It's a good business plan. And he basically says to her, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm worried about my own stuff right now. I may not even live long enough to you know, even honor this deal. And then the speech here that she gives is so good where she says, what does he say? My, my fate is already decided or out of my hands. And she says like, no, fate is like a sword, you know, and it depends. It, it depends on who's wielding it. Like what happens with it is it depends on who wields it. If you choose not to wield it, then yeah, whatever happens will happen to you, but you can choose to pick up the sword of fate and swing it in the way that you want it to go. And then she gives the example of her own experience of how she grew up in a, I didn't understand all of like what, uh, I can't remember the term she used. I'm not sure what that means, but my guess is that she grew up poor and at a low station. And she was like, that was enough for most people to give up and be like, well, that's my lot in life. But she was like, no, I said, I learned from the school of hard knocks. I took all the things that were around me the experiences that I had and I used those things to build myself up. And now she's like, I'm one of the most successful people here now. I'm running my own tea house. I'm making my own way and I'm making plant future plans. I couldn't have done that if I hadn't been raised and born the way that I was. I used my skills to use as stepping stones, my experiences as stepping stones to get where I am. And she's like, Toronaga, I know you've got the same story. You've had a rough ass life too. And that's why you are this very smart, cunning man that you are now. So she's like, if you're just really gonna leave, you're just gonna step back and let fate happen. And then she brings out the fact that he left a very, what'd she say, a gap in the security or something like that. I'd have to go back and watch. I don't remember the exact wording, but she basically said that there was a glaring error that was made that allowed for this whole occupation to happen by his brother. And she's like, I just don't feel like that's something you, you of all people, Mr. Warlord, this is not your first battle by any stretch. You've been a warlord for over 40 years and you're telling me you missed this very glaringly obvious thing that even I as a civilian courtesan noticed? I have a hard time believing that. I feel like you might have another plan that there might be something that, that's going down that maybe none of us know about. And that's why I'm coming to you still and with this plan, right? And so you see Toronaga has this very, and I love the way he's looking at her like, damn woman, you a little bit more, you a little too observant, ma'am. <laughs> you see it a little too much. What are you talking about? But anyways, he of course deflects and says, no, no, it was just because I was desperate, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, he sends her away and she of course plays along like, oh yeah, sure, sure. Right, I must be, must have been imagining things. But she leaves. And I really like that I said in the episode that Toronaga in his will, because he ends up writing a will anyways, he, he ends up giving her exactly what she asked for. And that's why I said that like, this is why I don't think Toronaga is like a completely cold blooded person. Like I think there definitely is a desire to do good and a sense of, well, either we're a kind of a sense of obligation to support the people he can when he can, especially if he respects them. But how ruthless can he be? How ruthless is he willing to be? And I think that's what's holding him back. And that's what he was really mulling over when we saw him just standing in the woods thinking about what to do. I think that it's not that he doesn't have other ideas and plans. I think it's just that all the ones he can see right now don't end without a lot of people dying, a lot of his people dying. And I think that's really what he's trying to avoid. Because before the landslide, when the idea of the people would come to him and he could pick them off, thin their numbers, he knew he would lose people, but the idea like it would be much less, right? Mostly frontline people would probably be the casualties of something like this. But with his brother, the way things are, like he stood to lose the entire seaside village or damn near all of it. A lot of innocent people that did not ask for this, right? He literally brought his military there. These people didn't ask for this. So I think he was just dealing with that moral dilemma of how much, how big of a sacrifice is too big, too big. Like well, how far is too far? What do I do? And do I just risk potentially it ending with me, me losing this time for the sake of all these other people to live or, or not, right? So it's, it's a huge decision. I felt for him, this is not an easy choice for anyone to have to make. And of course he's still got his loud son barking in his ear talking about, you know, we gotta do this, you never, we gotta, like, boy, you don't know nothing. I love how he looked at his son and said, it's always the people who've never actually been to battle or war that are so quick to wanna jump into it. Cause if you'd ever experienced true battle, you, are, you know it's the absolute last answer. It's not something that's glorious or beautiful. That's the one thing Toronaga's brother said that wasn't complete nonsense is that there's no glory in dying when you don't need to. None. 
<laughs> it's just death. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. So anyway, that was kind of the, the battle we see with Toronaga all episode long. And then we see also the conversation with him and John was poignant when John is coming in basically like, so me, my ship, when can I get back out there? When am I going to run things out on the sea where I can actually be useful and also be in my boat just in case? And Toronaga is like, I can't even deal with you right now because I know that your ass is going to try to bolt the first time you get a chance. And again, I don't blame him, to be honest. I've said what I've said, you know, with John, I don't feel sorry for him in the sense if he did come here, we got to remember he did come of his own volition. I know he didn't come here for war, but all the same, my man did not need to be here. He could have been safely in his home when all this was going down. However, all the same, he did not ask to be part of this war and it isn't very fair that he's being pulled into it because Tornog is the only person who doesn't want to cut his head off, <laughs> right? It's really, it's like either I get killed by the Christians or I end up in a war where I'll probably die anyways. That's kind of, that, that does suck. That's not a fun place to be in. But anyways, he basically is like, I don't understand like why I'm like, what's going on. He tells Tornaga, you give me all these gifts, but then whenever it comes down to where I might become of use or where I see my part in all of this, you're quiet. There's nothing to say. There's nothing for me to do. So I'm confused as to what I'm supposed to be doing or why I'm here. And again, I think it's his way of letting Tornaga know that you can't distract me with shiny things, sir. I know you're up to something and that it involves me not leaving, even though I need to get out of here. And so um, we see that Tornaga basically says, I'm not talking about it anymore. Leave me alone. And Mariko begs John to drop it and not to keep pushing. And thankfully, as I said in the episode, unlike that night with Bontaro, he actually listens this time and says, you know what, all right, I won't push. Let him know, I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll still be loyal, but I've said my piece. He knows that I'm I'm up to, I'm hip to him now, right? So that happens. And we also see with Mariko that there is a lot of Bontaro just observing Mariko and John, which I don't think he's really done that before. Now. Like, I mean, I think he saw some of it that night when everything went down, but now he's really seeing them, right? Especially since the night of the courtesan, right? Because she was kind of ticked at him after what happened the night, um, you know, the night where he she got hurt. But since they kind of made up in uh in the tea house, they're clearly back on their terms and they're closer than ever. Let's be real. And Bontura's picking up on it, right? The vibes are there. The chemistry is chemistry. And it's jealousy, pure unadulterated jealousy. And it's it's fair. I mean, that is her husband. However, I think it's it's even more than the fact that he's her husband. It's, we heard him say last episode, I've never gotten so much as a twinkle in her eye. Like not one warm moment have I had with this woman since I married her. And this man shows up and she's smiling. She's giggling. There's warmth. I see the potential of what I could have had in a wife, but I don't have. And that's what he's jealous of that he's mad and this is why when he went to we see him that he went to Toronaga and he's like give me permission to take out the the engine let me do it and he's like why and he's like because I don't like the way he looks at my wife right he's trying to make it seem like he's done something indecent and I love that Toronaga ever fair ever smart says okay so then you think your wife's also encouraging this and this is because you're saying you're that you're basically accusing them of adultery and it takes two to tango so you're saying that he's He's committing adultery with your wife who's committing adultery, which means that they both got to die because that's the way it works. So that's what, we're, that's what we're doing. That's what you're asking me. You want to take take your wife out along with, with John? And of course, you know, Mariko's sitting right there and he can't even look at Mariko, which is very interesting. Bontoro can't even look at her. But anyhow, he's like, no, I don't want to kill her. I just want to take him out. And it's like, and I love it, you know? So poor, poor Toranaga, the family counselor, uh, now forget warlord. He's now the, the, the family counselor from Montoro and friends. He's like, no, let's, let's sort this out because what the heck, that's not the way it works. Either they're having an affair or they're not. You can't just take out one person from the affair. It's a two person thing. What's going on? Are you accusing your wife? Is that what's going on? And then he asked Mariko, he's like, do you have anything to say about this? And she's like, listen, I don't even have it in me. My husband want to take me out. Please God, please. I'm tired. Let me go. And so of course, Montoro don't like that answer. Of course it makes him look more like a jerk. But really, it's it's the truth because Bentoro doesn't want to take her out. A, I think part of him wants to kind of punish her a little bit by taking something that he knows makes her happy. But really, he's mad that John is the person who's bringing out the real Mariko, who's bringing out this light and this, this happiness and this radiance that's always been inside of her. He's angry that John, whatever John has, is bringing that out of her and that he doesn't have it. That's why he wants to take John out. Because he knows Mariko hasn't done anything. Well, I mean, he doesn't really know, but you know what I mean? <laughs> he knows that in this situation, she's doing her job, but 
he's jealous of what John is capable of where she's concerned and that's why he wants to take him out. And so anyway, I like that in the end, he had to pull, roll it back because he doesn't want to do that. He's not ready to take Mariko out, whether that's because of love or because of his son or just because he wants to have a chance to do that. I wouldn't be surprised if he does love Mariko to some degree or is falling in love with this version of her. But either way, that actually, that gets taken care of, thank God. But yeah, I feel really bad for Toronaga for having to continuously deal with this. But then when it's all said and done, an interesting moment between Toronaga and, Toronaga and Mariko, where he basically says to her, girl, this, I'm tired, right? Between John asking to leave a couple of days ago to whatever happened at the tea house, to now your husband's over here. Like, I'm tired, duh. I'm tired of this. What What's going on? I need you to tell me right now, like, where is, where, what you doing? Are you working for me? Are you doing what I'm asking you to do? Or are you gonna keep doing things for your new little boyfriend? I need to know because I, I can't, I, I can't be doing all this. And Mariko says to him, she doesn't answer his question. She doesn't give him a yes or a no. Like she first says, I'm your servant. But I love that he said, that's not the, what I asked you. Because you saying that I'm your servant is basically a cop out saying, I will do what you're forcing me to do as your Lord, but not because I want to do it because I'm actively choosing to do it, right? So he's like, no, I need you to say to me right here and now, is it John or me? And she doesn't want to choose, which is understandable because of course she believes in Toranaga. Of course she respects him, but John is the one good thing in her life right now. John is the one thing that is not making her hate every single day. So she's like, I don't want to. And also I think she understands that both John and Toronaka have very valid points here. Neither of them is more right or wrong at the moment, right? So I love that she just switches the subject and says, look, bro, I can't. Between my husband, you, John, I, I, all the men in my life are stressing me. Here's a blade, end it, please. <laughs> just take me out of the equation if that's the case, because I cannot, I cannot. So anyways, we knew that Toronaka was never gonna do that because he's just not that kind of guy. So yeah, that's still some family drama going on. But um, that kind of just, I think, is just more on Tornaga's plate of all the things that are so messed up with this situation and how locked in he is as far as not being able to make a choice that's not going to end a lot of lives. So we see what happened in the end where he basically decides to surrender because he thinks that that's going to be the safest option. But he knows that by doing that, sadly, it means just like Mariko said, that most likely his son is going to go with him and everybody else that chooses to be loyal to him or to be seen as loyal men are going to have to go too. So there will be death, but at least the village will most likely be safe as will the extended servants, etc., that are associated with him. And uh, we see how that did not go over well. Obviously, Yabishige is always looking out for his own neck and he didn't want to hear that. And his son tries to speak up, but Tornado's like, it's my choice and I don't need you guys to say anything. This is it. Let me just, let me just go and do this. I'm kind of, I'm out of, I'm out of tricks that will work in this situation without bloodshed. And John, of course, he knows what's going to happen now because Mariko explained it. He basically is like, this is not what, this is not what I got. Like when we talked all those weeks ago back in Osaka when I showed you the map of the world and told you what the that what the uh Christians are up to like the man there told me that like he was he was a fighter he was someone who was willing to go up against the craziest of odds that's one of the reasons I was willing to align with you sir and now you're telling me you're giving up right and that's what he basically says you realize you're all dead like this decision doesn't work this doesn't work like we might as well fight because even if you surrender there's no guarantee they're not gonna wipe every last one of us out. And John knows that, yeah, I'm definitely gonna die, <laughs> right? He's signing all of our death warrants. So he kind of says his piece and walks off. And, you know, Toronaga, you could see, was bothered by what he said, because we know that he does respect John and that him and John are very kindred and that idea of always like wanting to fight when their back's up against a wall. But I don't think John really is understanding the level of weight of what Toronaga's weighing out right now either. But he's not wrong to speak out for himself and be upset about the fact that he's been given a death sentence again. So that's kind of what rounds out the end there. And there's Tornaga supposed to leave the next day. And outside of that, you know, the kind of there are little other pieces that happen. You know, we see the Tornaga's son this whole episode. That's why I kind of knew he wasn't gonna make it out of this episode. He was doing a lot of this, a lot of this. And I kept saying this kid is nothing like his dad. Like he's so different than Toronaga in so many ways, like the arrogance. And I know a lot of that is just youth. You know, when you're young, you don't know any better. You think you know everything. And Toronaga has taught him a lot. And of course he's living under the shadow of this big, great Lord Tor Toronaga that he feels like he's got to live up to. But you'd think this kid would observe more about his dad over all the years. And he clearly didn't because he would have known that half the stuff that he was saying would never be Toronaga. But yeah, we see that a lot of that big talk and a lot of Omi, kind of encouraging that flame of 
defiance ended in what we saw at the end of the episode, right? He decided, and I'm pretty sure Tornag had nothing to do with this. I don't know though, but I'm pretty sure he didn't. He and possibly a couple other people, other soldiers who were not willing to go out quietly decided to take a shot at his uncle and in the end, he hesitated. And that's, again, why he's not Toronaga's son, because I can tell you right now that if Toronaga decided to take out his brother, he would not have hesitated. It would have been a decisive blow, or 19 decisive blows, however long it takes to get the head off. <laughs> but yeah, so he ends up hesitating not once, but twice, and dying in the absolute most, t like, sad way. I can't say, there's no other word but sad. It was an accident. It's something you can't possibly have seen coming, but... Sad. Would it have been better if he had not done anything? I don't know. In his mind, he probably thought, if I got to go out, let me at least go out fighting. That was his choice. But to go out like that, and really because he hesitated, because like I said, if he had used the momentum of running after his uncle and went for that stab, he probably wouldn't have slipped. But anyway, he's gone now, and his uncle still remains. What is this going to mean? What, what will this mean for Tornaga? Because I think that's the only son we've heard of him having. He might have more kids, but that's it that we know of. That's his legacy. That's it. So what do you do now? And is he going to think that his brother did something? Is he going to think, is he going to believe his brother that he slipped and literally took himself out on a rock? Who knows? We'll have to see. But yeah, things, I don't know where things are going to go here. I just can't believe, I don't want to believe that Tornaga is giving up for real. I think that between what John said, Mariko kind of giving up on things, and then now losing his son, I really don't think that he's going to feel like this is the way to go out, to go out kneeling to a slime like Ishido and ending up dead anyway. Like, I just don't think that that's the way that he's going to want to go out. So we'll have to see how this all affects him. If this is going to be the last straw for him playing nice. And the only other thing I wanted to bring out is that I don't think that this plan of recruiting his brother was Ishido's idea at all. I think it was Ochiba's. I think Ochiba was the, the mastermind behind what string can we pull that Toronaga might necessarily not be able to counteract or that he wouldn't think of, right? Because yeah, I feel like Toronaga already knows how Ishido and all the other regions think. And this was something he didn't anticipate. I really do think he was shocked by the Regency thing. So, hmm, we'll have to see. If it was Lady Ochiba, I gotta give her points because that's masterful. That's masterful. It really is. So, whew, this is a heck of an episode, guys. There's, there was a lot. There was a lot of stuff. Like I said, not a lot of action, but tense the entire time, wondering what was going to go down, how this was going to go, what little spark could cause. You saw everybody was ready to draw a sword at a moment's notice. That shows you how tense the, everything was. And I felt exactly the same way. So now that this is another ripple effect, another unforeseen occurrence, I'm really curious as to how Toronaga and his camp are going to handle it. And I'm looking forward to next week's episode as usual to find out exactly what's going to go down. So I hope you guys enjoyed watching along with me. If you did, please show some love to this video and I will see you in the next one.